Is this better? Yeah. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, it is my honor to introduce this year's Carhartt Lecture here to campus. Dr. Brett Leanwall from as you can see up here from the School of Mines. Um, he received his PhD from the University of Utah. He has spent some time outside of academia as well working um, as a professional engineer in industry. So he brings loads of experience from the ind industrial side as well his, as his research um, there at School of Mines. We will have a portion if you have questions. Um, as we have many students in here, make sure you're writing down questions. We will have time at the end to ask any questions concerning the research, either what he presents here or if you did a little bio search and you have some questions, to go ahead and ask um, questions for that. But if you could, put your hands together for Dr. Brett Lingwall. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh it's a delight to be here and to be sharing some of the research that this wonderful research group has been working on it at South Dakota Mines for the last five years. Um, we're, we have a deep team at Mines, and much of the work that I'm going to be showing today is collaboration. We call it transdisciplinary research because it involves individuals from a wide range of the sciences. And um, I probably won't be able to answer the microbiology questions because I'm not a microbiologist, but we have two excellent microbiologists on the team that can. I probably can't answer the geology or petrology questions. That's why I have team members who I can rely on who do that part of the work. Uh, many of the great challenges of today can't be solved by what we call siloed or single disciplinary science. science. And the things we're going to talk about today, um, the, the, my five colleagues here on the, uh, on the screen are just, uh, just a small part of this deep team of collaborators at, <coughs> at Mines who have, who have helped us, and also collaborators at uh, some of the national labs and some government agencies who have been working on some of these parallel topics that we also collaborate with. The big thank you is for the money. The money comes from National Science Foundation. Um, <clears throat> they're a wonderful funding agency, and we were, were pleased to have some, some, some modest grants from National Science Foundation that have funded a number of graduate students. I'm going to show work from two particular graduate students, um, <clears throat> one from Magan Vaughn, who is a chemical and biological engineering student, and another from Madison Betts, who is a geology and geological engineering. A graduate students. So we have students from across the campus working on these projects and we're going to interfinger some of the, some very different topics together from several different projects today. We also have some projects that are tangential to USDA funding with um, collaboration with SDSU and there's a lot in this carbon space. <clears throat> so why are we here? Well it's because of uh, rising greenhouse gas concentrations. And uh, it's not just carbon dioxide. We're going to talk a lot about carbon dioxide today. But do not think that carbon or simply carbon dioxide is the sole thing we need to be looking at. Um, we have CO2, carbon dioxide, CH4, methane, and then N2O. And these are, this is, you know, I get, you know, the credit for whatever is at the little bottom there. But this is just showing how as greenhouse, as time has gone on, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere have increased. Um, I'm trying to get this laser pointer to work on here. Eh, it doesn't. Okay, so maybe I can get the laser pointer tool here because I want to highlight one little bump. <clears throat> Do you see this little bump right there in where the CO2 went down a little bit? Anybody know what that period in human history was called? It's called the Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age was caused when Europeans came to the New World and brought with them a number of diseases which decimated the native population. The native population, tens of millions of people died who used burning wood and charcoal as their sole means of heat and for cooking. With that massive drop in the population, there was a massive drop in atmospheric carbon dioxide that triggered the Little Ice Age. Fun little fact about that little bump right there. Most of our conception of what North America should look like as Europeans comes from that period of the Little Ice Age. And you can see how that is dominated by what's happened since the Industrial Revolution. I mean, it kind of really sets in perspective the, um, if you understand what the uh, Little Ice Age was all about and the impact to, to the global economy, whew, we could be in for a wild ride here if we don't get things calmed down. Relative greenhouse effect. Now, I'm putting this slide up because I want us all to understand that there are a lot of factors at play with atmospheric gases. Carbon dioxide is by far the largest contributor by volume to atmospheric climate gases. However, it is not the most potent. With 
decreasing concentration or amounts shown on this slide um, from climatenow.com, as you get into the nitrogen gases, so if we use a CO2 equivalent, so methane might be 20 to 30 times more potent as uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, the nitrogen gases are 100 to 300 times more potent. So it takes less nitrogen gas to get the same equivalent as carbon dioxide. And when you get to the fluorinated gases, we're talking thousands to tens of thousands of times more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Now it's fun and easy, convenient to talk about the, the carbon dioxide, but by no means should our conversations in a holistic sense be limited to carbon dioxide, especially when fluorine gases come from electricity infrastructure. And as we build more green infrastructure for green energy, <coughs> there's an unintended consequence nobody wants to talk about. But let's keep the focus on carbon, because carbon's nice and we like to talk about carbon. But let's, I'm actually going to show a, a nitrogen cycle slide here. One of the things we need to understand about natural processes and that are ongoing even with, uh, in, in the face of industrial revolution, they're these, these gases are continuously cycling. So the nitrogen cycle here, um, those who are working in the ag industry in the room will be intimately familiar with several components of, of the nitrogen cycle. Um, the National Academy of Science says the nitrogen cycle is one of the grand challenges, even a grander challenge for us to solve than the carbon cycle. Um, so nitrogen's always cycling, and there are, there's a soil component, there's an industrial component, there's an ocean component, there's all sorts of unintended consequences to putting fertilizer in the ground that influence a number of environmental factors. Meanwhile, carbon is also cycling. Every person in this room is an active participant in the carbon cycle. We are bringing carbon into our bodies almost continually, and we're letting carbon back out of our bodies almost continuously. Pretty much every industrial and life process enjoyed by human beings is part of the carbon cycle. So when we have too much atmospheric carbon, the atmosphere is trying to dump that carbon back out of the atmosphere because it doesn't like excessive carbon in the atmosphere. There are delicate natural balances. However, those take time. So. Unfortunately for us, human processes are much more efficient at getting the carbon out and into the atmosphere than the atmosphere is, is efficient at getting it back in. So I do want to take an aside and talk about carbon budgets here. So in the news and magazines and on websites, we see all sorts of figures about carbon budgets and about line. You can see one I, I took from physics.org there on the, um, the side of the screen that says emissions of, and this is methane by sector by 2020. And it, you know, it, it makes livestock look like this horrible, horrible thing. Well, I don't know the calculus that went into this particular methane budget, but one of my research projects is in termite mounds. And we study these termite mounds extensively. And termite mounds are ubiquitous in the tropics and subtropical parts of the world. They're everywhere. They far outnumber large ruminant animals on, this, on the planet. And every single one of those termite mounds has, you know, hundreds of thousands to billions of organisms that are off-gassing methane continuously. Now, that beautiful termite mound, which my colleague Dr. Andrea Surovec is standing next to, which is quite tall, the termites don't live in there. They live below ground in the nest where they farm fungus. And there are similar structures um, from fungus farming ants, which are also ubiquitous around the world. And they generate enormous amounts of methane. You crack one of these things open and you get overwhelmed by a lot of methane gas that comes out from the biological activity of the fungus farming insects. And that's nowhere accounted for in that carbon budget that somebody's put together. Now, I don't know who put it together or what their motives may have been, but it seems to me by my rough calculus that there are natural processes that are not accounted for in that carbon budget. So my recommendation, when you see a carbon budget or, you know, gas emissions by sector or whatever, always think about what are the assumptions behind that graphic, how complete it was, and what are the motivations by those who are proposing that graphic? So I just, that's just a general word of warning because science can be used to take people down the path where people want to go. So we're going to be talking generally about carbon. We're not going to blame the cows as the sole source of that's going to kill us all um, when there's no mention of wheat or human gut fermentation on this graphic either. Um, some of us are much more efficient fermenters than others. Those of us who are not efficient fermenters use Beano to keep that fermentation under, under control. And yet somehow the massive population of the planet, of human population, is not accounted for on these either. So just let's be careful when we talk about budgets. I want to talk about carbon credits as well. Um, carbon credits are a bit of the Wild West in terms of the economics right now. The current value for carbon is about $100 uh, per metric ton. If you can validate 
or hire someone who can magically validate for you producing some certifi certificate that you can use on a carbon market exchange. So you can, you can take this credit and you can buy it and you can sell it and you can do all sorts of things with it. But things to remember, carbon neutral com companies are generally not carbon neutral. If somebody's advertising carbon neutrality, what they're generally doing is they're buying somebody else's carbon credits that is being validated somehow mysteriously as a carbon sink and then they're buying those credits and they're using those as an offset even if the credits may be meaningless. And we're going to talk about some meaningless carbon credits here later today. M and much of the carbon credits are simply avoidance credits, meaning if we, uh, we avoided an, an emission by some sort of impactful activity by doing something that's slightly less impactful. And so you can sell the, well, we didn't generate uh, 1,000 tons of CO2 this year. We only generated 200 tons. So you can bank those 800 tons and sell them as a carbon credit. You're still producing CO2. You're just cleverly accounting your way out of the problem. So there's some, just keep th some of those things in mind as we talk about carbon credits as we go along today. Now, <clears throat> we are very efficient as a, an American and global society of capturing carbon from various industrial processes when we want to, such as ethanol plants. Ethanol, you know, pretty familiar process in this part of the world. Um, there are various gas products that off-gas from the various processes and pure CO2 is one of those. You can capture that CO2 and you can sell it to beverage companies. Um, if you've had a fizzy drink lately, your fizzy drink was likely carbonated not from atmospheric carbon but for carbon that came out of an ethanol plant. Pure CO2. So we're good at capturing it from facilities. We call these point sources. So point force source facilities we're pretty good at capturing carbon from. But getting bulk carbon out of the atmosphere is the problem. Now there are industrial processes that have been developed um, called direct air capture methods. Um, one of the most famous is the CarbFix facility in Iceland, um, which is a large centralized geothermal plant which uses geothermal energy and some high temperature processes that require significant energy to pull atmospheric carbon out. Then they inject it, they, they, they saturate it into water and they inject that saturated water into the um, ultramafic basalt formations that lay beneath. Iceland, and they're able to mineralize carbon there. We're going to talk more about that mineralization process later. We're working with a corporation called Carbon Blade Corporation. That's a mock-up of their technology, which are small deployable units. Um, we actively partner with Carbon Blade. Their, their technology is proprietary, so I won't tell you what it is or how it works. But they can get about 300 tons per year per unit, and their units are essentially just a shipping container, and they can power with renewables. There are many, many startups up there that have various technologies for pulling atmospheric carbon out of the atmosphere. So one of them that has had a lot of buzz recently was uh, Mission Zero, which is a UK startup. Uh, a link to their, their websites there. And their device uses um, an electro electrodialysis process. Um, they've gotten a lot of press in the news lately, and so I thought they were a notable recent example of a startup company that's raising significant funds to develop a, an industrial process to pull atmospheric carbon, CO2 generally, sometimes it's methane, out of the atmosphere. But then the question is, we've sucked the carbon out of the atmosphere, now what do we do with it? Because we can only sell so much pure CO2 to Coca-Cola and Pepsi. We can only have so many carbonated drinks in this world. Now what do we do with that carbon? Now for that, there are two principal paths that develop with many applications within those two principal paths. This is a figure that we developed for some National Science Foundation proposals, um, one of which is still pending, but there, it's kind of showing that there's a suite of different things that we can do and a suite of things that we need to consider once we have that carbon out of the atmosphere. Pretty much we're going to boil those down into two principal paths. The first, what we'll touch on briefly, is beneficial reuse. We're going to take that carbon, we're going to upcycle it into a product that we can buy and sell, or we can lock it away, which is called sequestration. And we're going to spend most of the time talking about sequestration today. Fundamental to both beneficial reuse and sequestration is verification, measurement representation and verification that the greenhouse gas was captured and is sequestered for 100 years. This is a difficult thing and as, an, as industry and as global partners, we really don't have very good ideas of how to consistently measure, represent, or verify that the, the things that we've sucked out of the atmosphere verify that it's actually carbon gas, verify that it's pure CO2, and then verify that whatever we do with it locks it away for 100 years. Now that's the heart and soul of a carbon credit is the locking it away for 100 years. Now we've already talked about how there's, we can use some shenanigans without doing that to, to get some carbon credits, but the heart and soul of the idea of a carbon credit is to capture it and lock it away for 100 years. 
Now, in terms of are there biochemical solutions for carbon capture, there certainly are. There are um, biocatalytical chemical, chemical, chemocatalytical, I'm sorry, I'm not a biochemist, so these words do not roll off my tongue. There are a number of biochemical solutions for captured carbon. Uh, most of those involve some sort of a process, and this is uh, from a recent publication from some researchers that are using a catalyst from turning CO2 and water into aviation fuel, to jet fuel. So the, uh, the biochemistry, as I understand it, not being a biochemist, um, seem relatively straightforward once you unlock the, the catalyst. The problem with these technologies to date is scalability, meaning they work really great in a lab. So we go over to this beautiful chemistry building next door, and we can do this in the lab in a small little reactor on the bench top, and we can do it efficiently and without much cost. But when we try to scale it up to produce the volume needed for an actual jetliner, there are scalability problems. And so some of these technologies are still in their infancy and still need uh, significant research in terms of scalability to make them meaningful for industry. Um, I love research papers and reading science journals. They, all sorts of beautiful pictures like this. Doesn't this you know, it look sciency and fill you with I, I, I like them. There are electrochemical solutions. This is a paper by uh, um, Calgon et al., where they're using a, a saline water-based mineralization pathway that pulls, it pulls seawater. Seawater is saturated with CO2. The CO2 is in the seawater. They pull the seawater into their reactor system. Their reactor system somehow pulls the CO2 and turns it into some sort of a solid. The depleted seawater is then dumped back into the ocean, and then they have these solids that they can either dispose into the ocean or truck to a landfill or find something else to do with. Um, this is uh, another bit of cutting edge research being done at, at another university. There are many, many people all around the world looking at how we can leverage natural and unnatural, human-made, <laughs> pathways to dealing with carbon. I want to take a moment and talk about natural pathways. So uh, we talked earlier how the atmosphere wants to dump carbon back out and put it back in somewhere else. Where does it do that? It can do it in two ways. It can do it into the ocean which is massive, or can do that on the land, which is also massive. The ocean, we typically have an inorganic carbonation process that is happening all around the world in the oceans every day, but it's slow. It's really slow. It takes a long time for carbonation to occur at the temperatures and pressures that exist at sea level around most of the world. Uh, the land is also massive, and, but generally when we talk about uh, carbon being pulled back out of the atmosphere into the land, it's generally an organic process where we're getting organic carbon. And um, most of that organic carbon is going not into the leafy biomass that we see above the ground, but it's staying in the ground and not in the roots. It's going into the microbiota and then the exudates that the plants are pushing into the ground to stimulate and feed the microbes. So we're going to talk more about microbes. So you better like small bugs as we go along. I do want to capitalize on this to talk about agriculture. Soil carbon is one of the primary sequestration modes and sources for atmospheric carbon. And in fact, if we carefully look at our carbon budgets, a great deal of the atmospheric carbon came out of the soil in the first place. It did not come out of somebody's tailpipe. It came out of the soil due to land management practices. Now, there are different agricultural practices around the world, some of which have been documented to be better at pulling carbon back out of the atmosphere and keeping it in the ground. We call those regenerative agriculture. The whole concept of regenerative ag is to feed the microbes. If we feed the microbes, the microbes are stimulating the plants, but they're also stimulating the plants to push the sugars and the proteins out of the plants, which are carbon compounds, into the ground to feed the microbes. And that's how we can get the carbon out there. This is very well researched. This is, a, um, this is Vilad and Nicholas 2024 looking at carbon sequestration potential from a number of different regenerative agricultural practices around the world. And you can't see it, the numbers are too small. But if you pull up the paper, you'll see, and many papers like it, we can put a lot of carbon in the ground, depending on how we manage our, our soils. The truth about soil. Soil biology was developed to be animal adapted and fire adapted for around most of North America. We live in fire and animal adapted ecosystems. Largely, we've pulled the fire off the landscape, and we pulled the animals off the landscape too. The microbiota, however, is still largely tailored for those paradigms. So one of the whole points of, of regenerative agriculture is to adopt practices that will help stimulate those bacteria and the fungi that can hopefully help with uh, 
carbon sequestration. I'm going to show you some work from Jerry Wright, who is one of my PhD colleagues at Mines. Um, the soil samples you see here, um, from black to tan, are the same soil. They're blacker. The blacker one has more organic carbon in it. That's not, you know, it's not char. This is organic carbon from healthy soil. And the deeper you go, the blonder it gets because there's less roots, there's less microbial activity, and it gets to the mineral soil um, down at the bottom. Um, so this is a uh, study that we performed where we were using compost amendments to kickstart soil carbon. And we were trying to see if we dumped a whole lot of compost, which is rich with bacteria and fungi and carbon, could we really get carbon sequestration to go in the soils, depending on management practices? And so the answer is yes and no. It's complicated. Here's the results. Let me distill it down. If we actively manage the land and we're doing active things to feed the microbes continuously, we can keep the carbon from the compost in the ground and we can grow it. But if we kind of just set it in there and we leave it there or we adopt more of a conventional tillage practice, the carbon oxidizes back out of the ground and it's going up into the atmosphere. So I th you know, I'm fairly convinced, based on the research that um, Jerry Wright performed, that um, compost amendments and other soil amendments can really kickstart these processes in, in getting carbon into the ground. But it's that management that matters long term. A lot of people ask me, can we just plant a lot of trees? Students, what's the answer? No. There's several reasons for that. First of all, carbon in a plant, in a tree, takes a long time to accumulate. We could get a lot of exudates into the ground much faster than we can get them in trees. Also, the, the carbon sequestration using trees tends to be large monocrops of single species of trees, which are horribly susceptible to wire, wildfire. They have some unintended consequences in, in terms of forest and landscape ecology. And we've, we have enough data now to show that the actual amount of carbon that is stored in a plantation of monocrop trees is actually much smaller than was advertised. And so it's just not, it's just not, it's just not a viable option. Especially consider the fact that there's probably more trees in North America today than there were three or 400 years ago because most of our savannas in the Eastern US have been converted over to forests of some kind because we've changed the landscape management of the Eastern United States and it's no longer a savanna, and now it's all woods. You know, there's, there's some things that the, the numbers just don't shake out for trees. Okay, now let's get to the core of my talk, and let's get all sciency. Can geology remove carbon? Yes, it can. There are multiple geochemical pathways for rocks to weather and then precipitate a carbonate mineral locking up the carbon. Here this is a process um, that we've been toying with this process in our labs. Uh, my colleague uh, Gosha Yusisinik, who's a petrologist, has been playing around with using asbestos, which is a mineral, crystallite. Chrysotile, excuse me, I always say it wrong. She always gets mad at me. Chrysotile, which is asbestos. Um, what we need is we take the magnesium from the top. We're going to use some process to strip the magnesium off off the mineral, and then we're going to combine that magnesium with some CO3, and then we're going to have a carbonate mineral that locks up four carbons, and we'll have, um, we need some water to make it all work as well. There's a change of P in pH that goes on with this process that has to be managed, but over time, m there are many minerals, some in the soil, some in rock, you know, that we can leverage for geochemical, geochemically precipitating carbonate minerals. The nice thing about a mineral, once I've got that carbon in the mineral, it's not just there for 100 years, it's there for millions of years. So I greatly exceed the 100-year requirement for a carbon credit. The problem of geology is there are these natural processes take significant time, mineral surface area, elevated temperatures, pressures, and or extreme pH conditions to occur. They don't just happen at room temperature, I just set things out and they immediately just happen. They can take long amounts of time to occur or require a catalyst. They may require significant mineral processing, which there's a carbon impact in terms of how many diesel trucks does it take, how much of this or that does it take to get that to work. So some people have said, well, why don't we just take our existing oil and gas infrastructure and turn it around? Why don't we capture some CO2, put it through a pipe, and then put it in take an old fracking well that was, we were using to pull oil and gas out, why don't we turn that around and just inject the carbon back into a favorable rock formation that's very deep with the idea that we can either just lock it in there with some sort of a cap rock formation that'll prevent the seepage of that CO2 back up to the ground surface, or we can mineralize it with the existing, with the rock depending on the chemistry of the rock. 
And so a lot of effort and a lot of digital ink and real ink has been spilled lately in the state on this idea of injecting CO2 back into deep rock. It can work and it may not work. The problem with liquid CO2 or supersaturated water with CO2 in it is it's slippery stuff. It tends to find paths back to the ground surface and there, it's very difficult to guarantee you're keeping it there. So with that, Department of Energy and EPA have only licensed a very small handful of class 5 well permits for actual carbon injection projects and there was the application um, from Summit Carbon to develop a pipeline across South Dakota and regional states. I mean, this was very famous. This was, this is a matter of public record. I'm going to show some figures from the public record. Um, and so the idea was that we could take CO2 from a number of ethanol plants and pipe them to a favorable geologic formation in North Dakota where they could be injected beneath a cap rock and that hopefully we could keep the carbon deep in the ground under this low permeability cap rock for hundreds of years. Now, full disclosure, my PhD was in pipeline design. So I'm naturally, I have a natural affinity to a pipeline. But pipelines are not without risk. Now, here's the thing I tell my students in civil engineering. Now, you're going to pay us civil engineers when you propose to do something, build something, you're going to pay us either way. You're either going to pay us to build it, or you're going to pay us to fight against it to not build it. So we're going to get paid either way. And sure enough, there was a heated debate about this pipeline project and many excellent issues were raised by both sides and, it, and in the end the pipeline permit was denied. Um, I do not wish to be political, but there's, good, there's really good arguments on both sides and the engineers who were working on both sides of the argument were wonderful, uh, wonderful people and had very good arguments. But there are some problems with pipelines, especially CO2 pipelines. One of the problems with CO2 is pressurized CO2 is remarkably corrosive and it takes some pretty good stainless steel to keep that from corroding your pipes. Um, so there are some fundamental corrosion issues that the pipeline designers um, had to answer. And then pipelines are disruptive. Um, you, know, I, you know, I spent a lot of time building pipelines and designing pipelines to take natural gas from Wyoming and take it to Utah for heating, heating fuel for the winter. And you know, there was a lot of problems that we had to circumvent. Eminent domain is a legitimate issue and there's problems with these pipelines. And so their permits are sometimes awarded, sometimes they're, they're denied, but in all cases they are very carefully considered. Um, although there are many ways we can meet or exceed federal DOT safety regulations, they're a disruptive process. Land is going to be disturbed, property is going to have to be acquired, it's, it's messy business to build a pipeline. So I look at, as a pipeline expert, I look, to, I look and I say, I ask the research group that I'm working with, can we develop a technology that would not require a pipeline? And the answer was yes. So what are we going to do? We're going to develop a microbial pathway to put the captured CO2 in the ground no matter where you are. Because if we take the right microbes and we tailor them for the rock that's beneath every site, I mean, you go, you know, there's only a few feet of soil and we're going to hit rock. We go deep enough in the rock, we'll find a geologic formation we can work with that has the right temperature, pressure, salinity, pH, chemistry, all the things we need with just a little tweak to the, bio, the biology and we can leverage the power of what's at every site, at least that's our thesis, where we don't need a pipeline. Because pipelines are messy business. So this is our quest as a research group in order to, to develop biomineralization pathways that sequester carbon that's captured from the atmosphere without having to pipe at long distances to a favorable geologic formation. Now, I am also a fan of a suite of technologies. So everything we talked about earlier, we're not seeking to replace you know, good management practices. We're not seeking to replace beneficial reuse. We're seeking to provide another technology that's another tool in the toolkit that society can use. Every tool has its place and every tool has its purpose. And when we use them together holistically, we can have some good solutions. So what are we going to do? We're going to biomineralize. Now microbes, what they do is they provide key acids and key enzymes to accelerate the carbonation reaction. For the chemistry students in the room, I'll let them follow this on their own. And everyone who's had, you know, freshman, sophomore chemistry should be able to read this, right? They should be able to, right? Okay, they should be able to. So what we're doing is we're taking CO2, a little water, some acid, and we're adding to it a cation. In this case, it's calcium. We could use magnesium, we could use iron, we could use nickel, we could use any metal, really. All we need is some positive valence. And we can bind that to the the CO3 at different, depending on the, you know, how much negative we need, and we can lock it up in a mineral. 
So let's look at some of these processes. So if the rock meteorology is right, we can produce the cations from the rock itself and consume hydrogen gas using organic acids and carbonic acid from the injection itself to facilitate the carbonation reaction. Now, as it's shown here, this is a chemical reaction. So we can use some microbes to get the acids. We can also use other sources to get the acids. The point of the acid is to strip the magnesium or calcium off the mineral and provide it so we can lock it on to the carbonate. However, there are enzymes that can accelerate this at temperature and pressure. And how do the microbes help? Well, not only they're giving us some acids to weather the rock and release the metals we need, but these enzymes can act as catalysts to the mineral precipitation reaction. What are the enzymes? Enzymes are produced by every, I don't, I'm not a biologist, I don't know how many cells in the body are producing, where's our biologist? But there's lots of enzymes in the human body. They're ubiquitous in nature. Microbes ex excrete these as part of their extracellular fluid. So it's that extracellular fluid that's, that's coating the microbes is rich with certain enzymes. Now, biomineralization can happen at any time and in any place. This is our, our good friend Dan Soder of Carbon Blade Carb Corporation. He picked this up in uh, Death Valley, in the floods, uh, the flooded lakes in Death Valley that have been in the news recently. Um, there were some my microbolites that were precipitating carbonate minerals on the lake bed of, of lower Paranagat? Par par yeah, that lake. I mean, it happens in nature. It happens at surficial times and places. Unfortunately, to sequester large amounts of carbon and carbon minerals, we need to directly use captured carbon, not relying just on kind of it just floating down on its own. And we need to do it at scales that allow for meaningful volumes to be sequestered or locked away. For meaning volumes to happen, we need, to, we need extreme temperature, extreme pressure, extreme pH. We're going to have some salt problems, salinity, and there are other conditions. Uh, the image you show here, this is some work from Bang et al. This was work that was done at South Dakota Mines by professors Bang and Bang. They were husband and wife, hence the name Bang and Bang. And, they, um, and these, are, uh, these are calcite crystals that have formed on sand particles using a, um, the bacteria was a bacillus. It's been since renamed to a sporosorcina. Um, but this uses what we call the urolytic pathway or the urease enzyme. As, and it works really well in, large, in small volumes at standard temperature and pressure. But if we're going to really ramp this up, we need the polyextremophile. Polyextremophiles are microbes that can tolerate a host of extreme conditions. So an extremophile is a microbe that can, can stand high pressure or high temperature or a really aggressive pH. A polyextremophile is a microbe that can, it can tolerate high temperature and high pressure and a weird pH and extreme salinity conditions. And they come from all sorts of extreme natural environments. Um, we have uh, some of the extremophiles that we work with in our lab have come from the uh, deep sea vents. Uh, they're wonderful microaerophilic bacteria, which means they've got a built-in kill switch. I love these microbes because they need just enough oxygen. If we give them too much oxygen, they die. If we give them too little, they die. Now, they are hazardous to one's health, so we can use that oxygen level as a beautiful kill switch to keep the people in the lab safe. Um, but they produce some very interesting enzymes that uh, accelerate the carbonation process. So we have done a pretty exhaustive search of some polyextremophiles, um, and one of the things that we found is that the secret sauce to all of this is the mineral ecology. We have to find polyextremophiles that can stand the, pre the conditions, but they all has also have to survive the actual metals that are in the minerals. And so if, we have a, uh, if we're putting them in a rock that has too much zinc, and they have only small zinc capacity before zinc toxicity, we'll kill all the microbes. So we have to really tailor the microbes for the rock, because the rock's the thing we can't change. The microbes are the things that we can change. So there's some unique opportunities there. A part of our research was the, uh, the great extremophile hunt at the 4,100 foot level of the Sanford Underground Lab in um, the, the northern part of the Black Hills. Um, our part of our research team um, is there. Uh, Dr. Tanvi Govel, Magan Vaughn, and Dr. Dan Soder uh, were part of the, the pro image here. We payloaded on another project um, where we took small rock samples that were waste samples from another project. They didn't need the waste samples, but we could use them to great effect. We also took a number of water samples, and we're looking for microbes that are hardy, tough bugs. Life is hard 4,100 foot below ground surface. 
The pressures are high, the temperatures are hot, and the water is not sweet. So uh, we've we isolated a number of microbes, um, DNA sequencing, all sorts of things that as a, an engineer I have no idea what the microbiologists were talking about, but they isolated some very interesting bugs with very interesting properties for us. We've done a great deal of preliminary work. Um, we have um, some reactors that um, our research team has built in Dr. Um, Musicinic's lab, who's our petrologist, where we are able to, uh, within a couple of weeks, which is, so a, a, in Iceland it takes about five years for the carbonation to work on its own. We can do the same carbonation in about two weeks with the microbes. That is greatly accelerated. Um, but we have to balance pH, pressure, temperature, and the microbes. So we're using microbes that are thriving about 60 to 80 Celsius because we need some elevated temperatures to speed things up. So we need some microbes that can live pretty hot. Um, and we've been able to document um, various carbonate minerals um, precipitating on some of the seed minerals. Um, we've been working with Carbon Blade to look at their, their volume there. Um, there's a lot of smart people in this world, and we got a lot of smart people in mind. So they have done some wonderful biogeochemistry. They've done some modeling of the carbon, carbonic and hydrase enzymes from, that have come off of some of our proprietary microbes. Um, we're, we're, we're not using urease. We're using carbonic and hydrase primarily. I do use uh, urease and urolytical bacteria in my, my lab for strengthening soils and for cementing soil to make them stronger, but not necessarily for carbon sequestration. Um, we've done some molecular docking studies of the carbonic acids, um, looked at a number of different microbes under different conditions, and it's, it all looks very sciencey, doesn't it? And it's wonderful stuff. Um, there's been some genetic engineering. Um, genetic engineering, it's interesting with microbes. So what we found is it's much easier to take the enzyme gene and take an, an enzyme gene from one bacteria and put it into another, into another bacteria than it is to take the genes that allow a bacteria to live at 5,000 feet below ground surface. It's really, because there's not a single gene that allows a microbe to live 5,000 feet below our feet in the temperature, pressure, pH regime. Much easier to take a carbonic anhydrase gene and clone it into a microbe that can survive at that level. Do I know how to do that? No, that's not my part of the project. But there's people who do. Um, so that's part of what we've been doing is with our proprietary bacteria is increasing their, their, uh, their enzymatic activity using some genetic engineering. And we like bacteria that have kill switches. So if they escape our conditions that we're providing for them, they die. Um, that's a big deal for Department of Energy. If you're trying to do any sort of a bioremediation or using biology, you have to document that if this bug you've developed or cultured gets, gets out into the wild, that it won't cause some unintended consequences. And boy, howdy, do we have a history of causing unintended consequences in this country. Um, so what we do is we vary temperature, pressure, pH, and salinity um, in our cold sill bomb apparatus. And we, um, we take various seed crystals. We provide various uh, nutrients to stimulate the microbes and feed them over time. We can, we can take pure enzymes, and we can rec recreate with pure enzymes. The thing we like about using live bacteria rather than just harvesting enzymes is when you harvest enzymes, you have one shot at doing the reaction. Because we put a solution into the rock, it's got the enzymes, it's got some other chemicals in it that are all you know, very inert, very innocuous. We'll get the carbonation reaction once. But if we use microbes, we can feed them, and feed them again, and feed them again, and feed them again, and we can have longer duration carbonation when we use microbes rather than just using the enzymes. Now, if I need an emergency fix and we need to biocement a slope, I'll use, you know, we can take jack beans, put them in a blender, get a bunch of urease enzymes, put some urea, and away we go in a really quick carbonation reaction at the ground surface. But not when I want sustained. Um, so analytical procedures, scan electron microscopes, um, and all the toys that I saw in the chemistry department this afternoon. Lots of very well equipped lab, by the way, um, the chemistry lab. I was very impressed. Um, mass spectrometry to look at metabolites and some different uh, things. Um, I haven't figured out how to use FTIR on this yet, but I'm going to figure it out. Um, we have some detailed results, results of our work that we're, we're, we're upscaling to some other grants and some other um, co commercial opportunities. Um, we've been able to, to document some pretty aggressive crystal growth in a short amount of time. We've tested Kilauea basalts, um, some fresh um, lava flows from, from, uh, from Hawaii that 
uh, somebody picked up and shipped to us, which was nice of them. We've been able to use rock from South Dakota and around the world. Um, yeah, for the biology students in the room, there's been some, uh, some genetic engineering. We've had some, some good fun. Um, so we're starting to work now with mine tailings and, and look at, at at surface reactor processes instead of just injection. Can we take waste rock from and, and other uh, mine residuals that are otherwise hazardous, can we use those as the seeds to create carbon bricks, locking up any heavy metals or other contaminants inside a carbonate matrix. And there's, we've got some pretty good preliminary results where we can take mine tailings with the right bacteria in the right reactor chamber and we can create a brick that functionally locks away heavy metals and radionucleotides away for forever. Um, there's some really exciting work that's going on in, in our labs on that topic. We do have some problems with separating out uh, separating out some of those solids in the reactor vessels. Some work we need to do now is, is with, uh, there's, whenever we use microbes, there will be a, a biomass effluent from a reactor system, and some of those microbes will be carrying excessive heavy metals, and so we're looking at some supercritical CO2 means for um, dealing with some of the biomass effluent coming out of the back of, out of some of these processes. Um, we can also use biohydrometallurgy. There's a lot of different things. Um, as a last aside, um, whenever we're dealing with microbially driven carbon capture sequestration, pesticides are a thorn in my side. Because we'll have a test site that's working perfectly well and somebody upstream or upwind sprays some plants with some pesticides and all my bacteria are dead. We have a pesticide problem. Um, we also find this in, in places where we have contaminated water, where we're using some groundwater for some field trials. We had some problems where the, the, the water we're using from a, from a riparian stream were contaminated with upstream pesticide, pesticide use. Um, kind of a societal problem, over application of pesticides and herbicides. There are a number of next steps that need to be solved. One of the things that our research group is, is, is working with is we're, we're working with um, we have a pending round with the National Science Foundation. It's a collaboration between um, MINES, SDSU, USD, Dakota State, and some of the tribal colleges on climate smart agriculture and using artificial intelligence to drive some practices that will um, drive better understanding of some practices to, to uh, accelerate soil carbon sequestration. We're hoping to hear from National Science Foundation soon. It'd be really great to get that one because my application for full professor is coming soon and I need a nice grant. Um, one of the other things that we need that we're working on is the termite mounds. So the termites have some very interesting microbes that live in their mouth and their gut. Even more interesting are the microbes that live on the surfaces in the tunnels in that mound. So that mound is super saturated with methane gas. There are very interesting methane oxidizing microbes that live on the surface of those tunnels inside that, that mound tower. We've, we've um, done some DNA work with them. We've isolated some, some strains that are in the uh, ATC culture collection in Washington, D.C. So we don't have to break federal law by culturing Namibian microbes. We have some of our own domestic microbes we think will work um, in using that, those methane oxidizing bacteria for methane capture and methane sequestration because it's happening in nature in every single termite mound. Um, you can see a, a, a carbon brick that was developed by our friends at Carbon Blade Corporation using some of their captured CO2 from their process. Um, and they, you know, sharing some of our biogeochemical work and their CO2 process making these carbon bricks. Um, and then there's just, there's so many opportunities for, in terms of land management and wildlife management and forestry management for really taking care of the soil. We've really neglected the soil in this country for a long time, and it's to our detriment. But there's a lot of things we can do to restore the savannas. Um, I'll let the biologists talk about that when we're where biologists go. He's somewhere around here. Um, one of the things that we're looking at as well is orphaned wells. So if you go to any area that's had a history of oil and gas development, there's um, whenever those wellheads aren't profitable anymore, they kind of get abandoned by the companies. And we call them orphaned wells because they're no longer maintained by a, an oil and gas company. And they, le they leak methane like crazy. Methane is just coming out of these things like crazy. We believe that a minor modification to our microbial process can be used to lock up and seal up those, um, those orphaned wells without having to use some of the other 
polymer technologies that are on the market. And then um, other next steps that are ongoing in our labs at Mines from some of our other faculty are taking CO2 and methane, upcycling them to formic acid, and from formic acid, upcycling them to a number of different acids and then into long chain polymers that can be sold on the market and some bioplastics. There's very exciting work happening in the Cape Lab and other labs at Mines on bioplastics that we're getting from atmospheric carbon. So I think the future of carbon capture Beneficial reuse and sequestration is quite bright. The thing that excites me is there are significant economic opportunities for the state. So the state legislature, the reason they fund mines is for economic development for the state. And graduates, yes, students too. But it's so we can develop new ways to make money for the state. And South Dakota is uniquely positioned with non-renewable energy resources, biology, knowledge of biology and biotechnology, um, leaders in innovative and novel land use management practices are being led by some of, the, some of our producers in South Dakota. They are world leaders. We've got some very creative and driven people in this state. And the power of the uh, polyextremophilic microbes, we have a unique combination, I think, in the state to really drive some economic growth and opportunities across different economic sectors, so which is very exciting to me. So, um, I've talked enough. I understand that there might be some questions. So with that, that's the end of the talk and I have some questions. I know I spoke fast, so. Just one quick one. Yes. Uh, we're seeing some limestone uh, and advertising as a capture. Any information on that? I don't know who's advertising it, but yeah, there's potential. But the questions are always scalability and how long it's going to take, depending on what, what specific thing that they're selling. So limestone, it's a sedimentary rock. It's not particularly replete with some of the, uh, the metals that we would like, but there's certainly potential. We like what's called ultramafic rock, which typically is a uh, uh, igneous rock. Um, those ultramafic rocks have a lot of those easily removed magnesium calciums. So we've worked with peat lean and Son. I don't know if you know peat lean. They have some, some material that could be ground. Paying for the research is the problem, of course, but it has potential to be ground and put on fields and weather away and could do some of that as well. So limestone is made by biomineralization. It's just it happens in the bottom of the ocean. It takes a long time. So we have some work with microalgae to create essentially limestone in the lab, pulling the CO2 out and using microalgae to create limestone. So. It seems like uh, the CO2 is kind of a recycling process between Earth and the atmosphere. And if we use this mineralization process and, and make it more permanent, that it will not go back into the atmosphere, in the long run will we reduce the amount of CO2 available to produce uh, vegetation food for the population and kind of playing to the hands of the people who want to go down the eugenics path. Thank you. So um, I don't think we have the capacity to pull that much. I don't think we have the literal energy resources needed to pull that much carbon out of the atmosphere ever. Um, and when we talk about locking it up in a mineral, we're talking, you know, on the orders of hundreds, thousands of years, carbonic acid can break that cal calcite, calcium carbonate back down as well. So it's not forever, 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 but the skills we're talking about, the sheer volumes we're talking about, just I don't think we have enough physical resources available to us as a human economy to do the thing that you just mentioned. At least I don't think so. We'll never have enough metals to do what you mentioned. And metal ends up being the, probably the biggest limitation on a lot of this. How much have you been able to scale up your process and can it be scaled up to large quantities of CO2? Well, if Department of Energy will give me five million dollars here in the next three months, we'll prove how big we can scale it up and how short of a time. But uh, we don't have that grant yet. But we, we can do very large volumes um, with the uh, ureolytic pathway um, at ground surface in, an, in a single shot. Um, but the, the big thing is the deep underground storage. And that we, we can do, we can, you know, bench scale, but we're not to the field scale yet. Uh, so is there a way that we could, is there a way that we could stop 
a lot of these carbon producing companies from using this as a moral justification to like lobby their governments <laughs> and just produce more carbon and basically offset what we're doing? Is there a way to stop them Who's from doing Who's the economics that? professor in the room? No, certainly, this is a good question. So this is a question of fundamental to economics. It's a question of value. So there, the question is the monetary value of a carbon credit versus the societal value. And sometimes societal value and monetary value converge, and sometimes they greatly d diverge. Um, there is great societal value in carbon capture and sequestration. There's great financial value. But they don't necessarily align. So financial value tends to be short-term gain at the expense of long-term cost, where societal value tends to be flipped the other way around. It's short-term loss for long-term gain. It is very difficult to uh, reconcile those timescale differences in terms of value of what we're doing and what we want to do. I don't think we can ever stop the short-term thinking, but the more value society places on long-term benefit, the more the economics changes so that long-term benef benefit becomes more and more important. But to answer your question, I'm not an economist and I can't answer that. That's a great question. There's also a philosophical and ethical argument in there too, but that's his, his department. Ah, oh, yes, thank you. How much danger are we in with uh, we, to, for people online? Saturation? For people online. Yeah. How much danger are we in as a society with carbon saturation and causing? problems within our culture oh geez I I'm not the world's greatest expert on on this I can tell you from my field of study and from what I work with so as a civil engineer I work in infrastructure so some of the problems that are of great interest to civil engineers and I'm a soil and rock engineer um, we have significant multi-billion annual cost increases in permafrost thaw on infrastructure in the uh, northern latitudes and when I talk multi-billion dollar, that's multi-billion dollar annual infrastructure damage. Uh, much of what the infrastructure that was designed in northern climates assumes the ground is frozen because frozen ground is nice and hard and easy to work with. But as that permafrost thaws, it becomes mushy and spongy and roads and pipelines that we rely on for much of our energy infrastructure sinks into the ground. We deal a lot with storm protection, flood protection. One of the things that I'm seeing in my flood and scour protection research is that um, as time goes on, the dries get drier and the wets get wetter. And there are some significant challenges to redesigning levees and water protection infrastructure for increasing variability and the dries getting drier and the wets getting wetter. And so we have increasing failures of a lot of our infrastructure systems that were not designed with that kind of an idea. Um, the thousand year floods, we can do a deep dive on what a thousand year flood means, but we should expect many more, we have seen many more thousand year floods than we predicted 50 years ago. Um, and that takes a significant multi-billion dollar toll on our flood infrastructure. Our coastal infrastructure as well, we've seen a lot of impact in the civil engineering space with changing flood paradigms and changing seasonal paradigms. And then, you know, people are growing pretty good grapes in Oregon now. And I, I'm not a farmer, and I can't explain that, but that used to not be a thing, so that's just my little sphere. I'll let the philosophers and the, uh, the, the verbose talk more grand skills. So you talked a little bit about um, parts of the carbon cycle or the carbon budget that are not currently accounted for. They're accounted for by different people at different times. Okay. So that was kind of my question, is how much of that budget is unknown and if to the extent that there is parts of sources for carbon or methane, et cetera, that are not known, you know, the magnitude or whatever, who, are there people working on tracking all that down? Have you heard of a little organization called NASA? Yes. yes. NASA and NOAA have a great deal of work going on in trying to use remote sensing to account for things and measure emissions and the cycling rather than just use kind of a, a guess of, oh, this industry kind of does this and this industry kind of does this and this natural process kind of does this. It's, a, it's an area of great and urgent ongoing research. Um, 
Yeah, I'm aware of several recent calls by NASA to increase remote satellite-based remote sensing to try to improve precision on measurements for carbon budgeting. It's a big deal. I'd like to go back to your days of being a pipeline engineer. Okay. Um, I was raised on a farm and everything, and every spring we'd have to pick rocks, pick rocks. We'd think, boy, that, that we're all done. I'm wondering how do the pipelines stay in the ground without working them without working their way up? So, if we're in an area with large topsoil losses. And so typically those rocks are coming to the surface and they're not migrating up, we're losing topsoil and they're ex being exposed generally. So if we have areas where, and there's parts of this country that have seen five to six feet of topsoil loss over the last 150 years. Yeah, you're going to have to put it down deeper. It's not floating necessarily, but it's being exposed by the erosional processes. You farm around it or somebody will have to rebury it at some time. Sometimes we do have pipelines above the ground surface intentionally um, when we cross faults. We like to put things on roller systems so that when the ground jumps two or three meters, 10 to 12 feet, we don't have the pipeline breaking. Um, but sometimes we're forced to put it under the ground. Um, pipelines, they're tricky. But you would be surprised by how much of the economy is carried by pipelines. And in terms of a low carbon footprint technology, nothing beats a pipeline. If you can imagine putting the amount of water and natural gas and oil that goes through pipelines and putting those on trucks, it's mind boggling how critical pipelines are to our society, despite their drawbacks. And yeah, when these things, if a carbon pipeline were to uh, burst, we'll call it, I wouldn't want to be standing next to it. I'd want to be several hundred yards over there and have really good hearing protection because it would be very dramatic and, and same with natural gas pipelines. And when these high pressure systems break, they're pressure vessels and the results are quite catastrophic. So nothing's without risk, right? But it's about that value and how much value we're putting on A versus B versus C to manage that risk, to manage all the competing demands that people in society have. Sorry, I got a little beyond what you asked, but well, yeah. Come on, students. Is that it? Any more questions? question back there, come on. Now in class, I, you know, I call on somebody, but <laughs> yeah, I don't I know it. names in here. Or maybe I'd think pair and share you and you'd have to, but no. They, they know think pair share, right? Yeah, yeah. Whether they like it or not. I'm, I'm gonna ask this question for one of my groups in here. Where is my, can climate change be reversed group? Because this sort of was a question I hope you guys would ask. So I have a, my general science classes here, and they have big topics they're challenging, or they're going through um, and taking a look at. And one of the groups, their question is, can climate change be reversed? If we want it to be. The question is not technology or technology that can be developed. The question is societal value, and if we really, as we balance all the competing demands on our time and money, what are the things that most matter short term and long term? Which is an incredibly complex value proposition which I'm not going to answer for all of American society, let alone global society. Um, but if we really put our minds to it, I have no doubt that we could. But I don't know if we will. I would also say there's, there are other more pressing ecological and environmental problems that maybe should be addressed as a priority. This is not the only problem we have. All right, if you guys could put your hands together one more time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was fun. That's a good question. Yeah.